Hello UK, hello Turkey and hello maybe Europe, who knows? I'm Bülent Büyükseyer and welcome to my very first live broadcast in English. Unlikely, but you might get that I'm not a native speaker and sorry in advance about my English. I'm guessing there are some viewers who doesn't have any idea what this silly doing. So let me talk very briefly about myself and smart talks. I have been in business for over 22 years now and as the founder of Smart Starts, Smart Starts Consultancy, I'm providing recruitment and HR services with my brilliant teammates both in London and Istanbul mostly. Coming to the Smart Talks concept, when I was thinking about uh, what I can bring around with very valuable people in my network and what I can learn selfishly in the meantime, it came to my mind to design this concept. I hosted more than 10 guests so far, and they were those who made a difference in the business world, stood out with their entrepreneurship, or inspired people, and of course me. Uh, my broadcasts were in Turkish until now, but if you come across a recorded session on YouTube that might interest you, please let us know. We will prepare the English subtitles for you as soon as possible. As you know, we are live on YouTube and LinkedIn now, Therefore, please feel free to ask your questions or leave your comments anytime. We will respond as quickly as possible. By the way, from now on, there will be at least one English broadcast in each month, and I promise my hosts will be just as cool as my guests tonight. Uh, speaking of which, let's uh, get to the reason of being here. We are on air again with David this time. Hi, David. Good evening, Bullen. How are you doing? Good evening. I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? Great, great. Good to join you and uh, very honored to be your, your first English podcast guest. So, yeah, good to exactly. be here. Likewise, and I'm very honored to host you. Thank you very much for uh, being here tonight with us. And uh, there are lots to talk, right? Uh, as a oh. guest of honor, <laughs> it's a good to wait to start the conversation. Uh, who is David Sturdy? maybe sure so um yeah so i've uh, i'm south african born my my father is from england my mother is from south africa i've uh, uh yeah been been working for yum brands now for about uh 13 years in the middle east out of dubai uh in in asia out of singapore and then uh working in europe out of london so been with them for for a while now most uh, mostly with uh, with the pizza brand and yeah i live in london now it's great to be here obviously working in europe uh, not as much travel happening these days as we all know but uh, yeah super excited to kind of share a little bit of the story and, and and chat with you tonight thank you very much and uh, of course we uh, found a fancy uh, topic for our conversation a journey to c-suite sea level so uh, and uh, you uh, gave me so many delicious uh, cookies uh, before uh, our conversation uh, by, during our preparation. So uh, I have many questions to ask to you. Sure. Uh, but but, but uh, I'll assure you it won't be very, they won't, uh, they won't be very difficult. <laughs> so, Great. <laughs> we will be talking about your career mostly, but on the way, uh, as you told me before, they, there were so many lessons learned and spectacular failures as sure. well. So uh, maybe uh, we can start uh, chrono chronologically. So uh, why chase a career like this in a, a big uh, corporate? Hmm. Yeah, sure. Good question. I, I mean, it's, I can definitely share my story. I mean, every, every individual, every person is different and, and what they're looking for is, um, is unique. For me, I guess, um, there were a couple of things. One is, I think it, I think these, well, there's many reasons. I think one of the, the first ones is you can go big and then go small, but it's difficult to go small and then big. So, you know, if you, if you're working for a, a sizable, uh, business and a big corporation, et cetera, you know, there's a lot that you can learn from that that I'll, you know, touch on in a moment. But if you go down the line and you take those learnings and you decide that you rather want to pursue another journey, I, it's my view that it's probably easier to then, you know, scale down and go and, and, and do something that may be more, uh, you know, own operated or, or whatever it might be. Whereas if you start off that way and you're kind of, you know, operating um, 
you know, if you you know maybe exploring something on your own or or in a smaller type of environment, it, it can be difficult to then scale up again and then say, okay, well actually now I want to go and see what what it's like working for big corporate. Um, yeah. But but that that transition sometimes can be can be difficult. So you know, the advice I give to a lot of people is is, is start big and 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 then from there you know take your options, etc. And for me, yeah. I mean, I, I I enjoyed it thoroughly. You know. Mm-hmm. So uh, I have never been a, a C-suite a manager or executive, but I, I have heard uh, or witnessed so many uh, stories about this. Sometimes at some point, uh, you are deciding to move forward, you know? Sometimes mm. uh, you can be lucky, uh, but of course you are, uh, int- uh, your intellectual level and uh, your preparation is good as well. But uh, Uh, what was the uh, scenario with you uh, at some point in your career? Uh, did you consider about being a C uh, suite executive, or uh, how did you become uh, a C yeah. manager? So I think to answer that, I'd, I'd go back a little bit and say, you know, yeah, and it's probably also an extension from your first question around, like, why, you know, why, why go after a, a career in a business like like this or a big multinational or whatever it might be, you know. And there's there's so much value that you can get from them. It's almost like a um, how would you say like a parallel education, right? Around how how people work together and how strategy comes together, and you know how to communicate and how to put forward ideas and how to influence, etc. And you know these these big businesses usually, um, and specifically in the case of young brands, who um, I've been very fortunate to work for some great people and who, who really value leadership. Um, You, you get all of this kind of education along the way while while you're working, right? And that uh, that I find has been um, has been so valuable. And, and that's you know again you know you say why why join and why do that? And I think that that journey is that journey for me has has always been I guess the focus, right? And um, and I guess the you know the the, the career pr- progression and as that comes along, I, that, that's you know that's that's very fortuitous. Um, but I guess I, I I'm not sure if it was ever the You know, maybe I had an idea that I would like to, you know, perhaps get to that level or whatever it was. But I've always found probably focusing on kind of that journey and where you are and, and delivery and, and the current role has always been the best predictor of, of moving forward, right? Exactly. So uh, have you been always uh, in operations organization in YAM? Or, uh, how, uh, how was your story uh, since starting uh, for uh, working for YAM? Yeah, it was always around. Um, it was always in that, and certain started off in that operational field, uh, whether it was around operational solutions or whether it was around you know driving operational performance in, in you know cross markets. It was always there, but I think the the kind of the business changed quite a lot um, over time, right? And and we saw that you know uh, operations was quite a physical thing, and and then obviously as as you know things became more and more digital. A customer experience was no longer just a, a physical experience, whatever it was—a digital and a, and a physical experience—and that's really where I think the, the probably the the role that I played started to, um, you know, and the job that I had started to broaden out a little bit because now I was looking at, you know, now I was being involved in, in more technical parts of uh, and and uh, you know IT related or digital parts of the business um, that before you know 10 years ago, 15 years ago, just wasn't really there, right? And and now the experience is this hybrid of physical and digital and And that that role has developed as that you know customer expectation has developed, you know, and and that to me has been fascinating. And you know, as that's opened out, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed that, you know. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, sure, for every level, not for just C suites, you should have the muscles of transformation, change management, and but uh, it beca- be- becomes more critical uh, when you go on with your career. So. Hmm. Uh, I uh, I'm sure you have so many challenges that you transform, for example, digitally with your organization, with the people, or with the process you're responsible for, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, sure. And especially in a you know, if you're working in a in a brand new startup, you may not have this this issue, right? Because you're you've got no legacy issues, and you're you're straight into um, you know the latest technology and the latest infrastructure, and everything is just. You know, it's shiny and it's beautiful. You know, the Pizza brand is about 1958. We were found, uh, founded, right? So, so we've obviously grown over the years, and 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 it's great working for a brand like that because it's got so much heritage and people connect with it, and it's um, you know, it's got a it's a rich brand. 
but on the other side of the, the, the coin is you have a lot of legacy issues, right? Um, so then as this customer expectation is, is changing because, uh, you know, there's disruption out there, right? Like the aggregators are changing things, even just the, the, the kind of, um, you know, if you order an Uber, just that experience around transparency and being able to see it and the ease of use, et cetera. Customers are changing their mind, changing their, their uh, expectations. The kind of you know, moving a, a brand that's got this heritage into this newer, uh, this newer area is quite, is quite, um, it's quite daunting, and it's not always, it's not always smooth, right? It's, it can be painful, and I, I, I'm not sure if there's any silver bullet. It's, it's really around. I think I found around just probably staying the course, um, and, and also you allow for it to be bumpy, right? When you're rolling out new technology, when you've got new ways of working, there's going to be a time of disruption and. You know, especially people who have heritage or, or people who work for the brand for a long time may you know there could be some adoption challenges and and you've kind of got to allow for that and say we're going to go through three months or whatever it is and we know there's going to be some noise and it's going to be some bumpiness and and we'll be prepared for that and and not turn around at the at the first sign of of trouble you know yeah I, I guess in the journey that that I've had and, and especially in the UK over the last uh, over the last probably 12 18 months has very much been focused on that and you know, there's times when you're in the middle of it and you're doing a big tech deployment and there's so much noise and, you know, things aren't necessarily working and you, you want to kind of pull your hair out and wonder what you've done. But, you know, having that conviction to stay the course is, is probably the most important part. Uh, exactly. And also, uh, besides the tr digital transformation, uh, there has uh, there is a uh, Brexit waiting. So mm -hmm. as a uh, all, head of all operations across UK and Europe, so it was uh, it it was another uh, or still being another challenge for you. Uh, yeah, sure, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think at the beginning of the year we said, okay, we had a year's extension, so now we got a year to figure out what to do, right? Uh, and then we spent all of this year so far dealing with the the COVID crisis. So it's uh, it certainly hasn't been great. I mean, I don't, I really don't have many answers on that. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're trying to do some contingency planning and figure out what's, you know, what's going to, you know, I guess the, the challenge I have to the team is what changes on day one, what changes on, on you know, 30 days later, what changes three months later and what changes a year later? Because mm -hmm. then we can kind of sequence and, and figure out where we're going to go. Um, but like all things, there's just so much uncertainty in it. And, uh, you know, we, we we hope that there will be some smoothness and, and, and that we will we'll get there. But obviously at the moment there's... Uh, there's a lot of unknowns, right? Which I guess is part of the job, right? You got to deal with unknowns and, and figure out and figure out contingencies. Exactly, exactly. especially in this era, right? Totally. Okay, so uh, how can you prepare to a C-suite uh, management uh, role? Sure. Uh, it's a yeah, good question. I, I, I for me, I guess. Fun question, I know. <laughs> Yeah, and, and there's so many different ways of, of navigating the world, and and everyone has their own style. I, there was a couple of principles that I think I learned along the way that that I value, right? Um, and the first one was around nothing moves a career forward better than making other people look good. And this kind of principle, and it's a, I mean, it's a great way to to operate in general, let alone you know, not not purely just for for career advancement. But I've always I've always valued this because it um it's counter it's counterintuitive to sometimes some of our more selfish instincts would be, you know, if something's going well, how do we get the how do we show that our, we're associated with a project and how do we make sure that our names and lights and, and flashing up there and everybody knows that we're performing well, etc. So that sometimes can be the you know that that first initial reaction as to how to um you know how to how to operate. But the reality is it's completely counterproductive. And, and the more that you the more that you support others and you, you make others look good, and you know, whether it's your boss, whether it's your colleagues, whether it's people that you work with, right? Um, it's a strategy that over the long term just will never ever fail, right? And again, this is this is more of an ideal and 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 something that I, I you know continuously need to challenge myself on. But I think that that would be the first one that I would say. And there's just so many examples of it of how, you know, by by doing that, you know. The long-term benefits of how you build trust and relationships, and 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 how these kind of snowball into something, I guess, meaningful, is, is important. Like I say, sometimes it's a, it's the opposite to how we would look at something, right? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes, uh, maybe this is my personal uh, opinion. Sometimes you you don't uh, you uh, you shouldn't afraid to 
uh, have mistakes, you know, to make mm. mistakes as well, because you learn so many things for from your mistakes. Totally Maybe, right. Uh, the affection, the area, uh, the um, how can I say, uh, the the results can be more critical uh, with uh, C levels, but sometimes you can make mistakes. We are people, not machines. Yeah, sure, and it's everything that you do before that's going to set you up for that, right? And you're right. It's a difference between are you playing not to are you playing not to lose or are you playing to win, right? Because if you're playing not to lose, then you can play very safe, and 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 the the appetite for risk becomes extremely limited, right? Um, and that's kind of a it's a self preservation mode, but I'm not sure how far that will really take you. So it's that balance of how do you how do you play to win? And when you play to win, there's there's risk, right? And you're you're going after bigger things and You know, as the as your career goes, the the, the upside or downside of of these these um, kind of initiatives can become quite quite meaningful. But but without without genuine um, and you know, risk is not risk is not to be uh, is not to be careless, right? I mean, to risk is to build contingencies and to understand, but also not to be afraid to say if this goes wrong, it's uh, you know, the, the, it, or, or at least prepare, at least put yourself in a position where you, where things can go wrong, right? Because if you're not doing that, you're just not stretching and not pushing yourself enough or, or probably moving forward, right? Yeah. Uh, can you remind us how uh, you are, uh, are you uh, managing uh, directly or indirectly? At the how many How many direct and indirect reports? Yeah. Um, so at the moment I have, uh, so at the moment I manage a, a team of six, uh, six really highly capable, great leaders. Um, Which works, I find quite well now. This, uh, initially, when I when I came into this role, I had more than that. Um, I had a yeah. team at one stage nine, mm -hmm. and it's just for me. I mean, there are probably of people with with more uh, with greater capabilities and who can manage eight or nine effectively. But I, I found managing eight or nine people was was really really challenging because exactly you just, yeah you just can't give them the the type of Because the role require the role is effectively one of a coach primarily, right? And and that that takes time, right? It's you got you got to put time aside, and you got to invest in people, and you got to understand them, and and really, um, you know, in, like I say, invest. So I did a bit of a you know re restructure towards the the beginning of this year and brought it into six. And one of the key learnings I found is, you know, where, you know, at direct level or whatever beforehand, it was it was probably okay to have. You know, if you had people doing the same role reporting into you, it would be quite normal. Like if you had, let's say, you know, three or four field-based, you know, managers that may be reporting in, then that was fine. I found um, with this coming into into this level that it was more effective to have, I guess, the kind of heads of departments reporting in as opposed to people that are are doing the same role. It just became so much more efficient. Um, You know, accountability is it was 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 just so much easier. You give people opportunities to learn through these leadership roles. Um, so I, yeah, I find six works quite well, and then obviously they they have their own teams, and then it goes quite broad from from there. You know. Yeah, I'm wondering something. I will ask you a, a mixed question, maybe fifty percent personal, fifty percent uh, about business. But uh, I think our viewers uh, will uh, relate to that. Uh, for example, uh, you are coming from a management group that you were working uh, as peers you know mm. so after that you're promote uh, you're promoted and uh, they are uh, starting to uh, rep uh, report you you know mm. Mm. so you are not uh, peer level colleagues anywhere uh, <coughs> anyway so uh, how how What was your case? How did you manage it? Was it hard? Was it challenging? How did you solve this? Uh, is the, the, uh, were there any problems? I'm wondering this questions answer a lot. Yeah, sure. So, so in this most recent one, where I uh, when I, I started this role at the beginning of last year, I actually transferred internally from our Asia Pacific office in Singapore to our UK uh, to our European office. So this this probably negated a bit of that, but in the past it it has happened. Um, yeah, it's I mean it's always a challenging one. I guess it's you know the transition is probably the most difficult part, and within three months a new normal a new normality has been has been found, and then you can you can kind of get there. I think the I think what worked for what well, what I find quite useful. The first thing to do was. Was in my own mind to promote myself, right? Because often sometimes you can get these these job uh, new, new roles can come in, and 
you know, you can doubt yourself a little bit in it. And then just by saying in your own mind, okay, I'm going to promote myself now. Now I'm, you know, giving myself the right to to go and act it, to go and, uh, and 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 do this new role, right? So what is that? What does that look like? What is the the elevated thinking, or what is the you know the the change in behaviors that that need to happen now because of you know the the new environment? And kind of you know that confidence internally to say, okay, now I'm promoting myself. Okay, so the company's promoted me. Now I, I promote myself as well. I find is is, is useful because that um, it allows you then to go into situations where you know there there, there may be some challenges or maybe a, a little stressful. People may be questioning, etc. But you can go in there with a, a certain amount of of you know, at least confidence or, or being able to, you know, feel feel that you belong there, right? And you belong in this new role. Because that's the key, right? And is really feeling like you belong there. And then the rest will the rest will follow. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm not just talking about uh, your com- uh, company you work mm-hmm. for, but generally, uh, is there really a, like Game of Thrones games uh, on uh, up levels? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm sure I'm sure it exists. I think we're we're quite lucky at Yum Brands. Is um, this the? It's a company that's really known for its culture, right? It's it's known for its integrity. It's focused on leadership, focused on development. It's focused on on the how we do things is as important as the what we do. And this, I mean, this this can sound like you know just something that's um. Sounds like something that I guess is just you know something that's given lip service or whatever. But the reality is that that it's a you know a company that that on the whole really lives by that, and that that I think, you know, that there's a the, we have a kind of unspoken rule in the business of no jerks, right? So, <laughs> so that type of like doing whatever it takes to you know to to uh, to succeed and you know dog eat dog and whatever like that just doesn't really wash with with us and generally those type of people who can't i guess form meaningful relationships or partnerships with people they work in uh, invariably don't don't last very long right um and i i mean to i guess I, every company is different and some have more aggressive cultures i mean we're we certainly don't this this shouldn't be confused with us saying that you know we don't aggressively go after something or we don't set bold goals or whatever it's just the way we do it we, we tend to try and be more collaborative in doing it And this is so 90s, right? It's so yeah. old, old fashioned now. So uh, Golden Gecko, exactly. That's yeah. old time, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, as a uh, Swiss so executive, uh, you are the advocate of uh, the company cu- uh, culture and strategy as well, so, uh, I guess. So mm. uh, how do you balance uh, strategy versus culture? And uh, how to you? Uh, how how do you action? Uh, how how? Uh, what kind of actions do you have uh, to these kind of uh, versus uh, situations? Yeah, sure. Because the I think, I mean personally, I I always went to the what's the strategy part, right? Because that's that's great. You get to, you know, be you know conceptual and then get to really engage on the you know the mental horsepower and, and go off and and have these you know great put these great plans together. And in fact, when we were doing the planning for 2020, right? So at the end of last year, and you know, we put our, our annual operating plan together, and there was a lot of uh, focus on that, and uh, you know, it was a good plan. And then I, I went off to holiday to uh, to Australia to obviously escape the uh, the UK uh, winter for a bit. And I was in Australia, right? And I was I had this real nagging feeling continuously around this plan, this strategy that we had, right? Mm-hmm. And then I would, you know, I would go back and I would think about it, and I would think about the components of the strategy, and they they always came about and felt like the right parts, but yet something was missing. I was thinking, you know, when there was this feeling that this alone is not going to get us to where we need to be, you know. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, I read a really, really book, a really, really good book called The Culture Code. Um, and then I guess I had that light bulb moment around, you know, there was so much focus on 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 strategy. But the reality is, it's the culture that brings it alive. Right? And it's, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever heard that that question. You know, what would you rather have? Would you have the the world's best culture or the world's best strategy? You know, and you to, uh, <laughs> I, I after after thinking about this for a lot, I think I would take the world's best culture any any day. And I'll tell you why. The world's best strategy, and, and not to say that ours was the world's best strategy, but it was a solid strategy, right? But how many people had been involved in that? Six, seven, maybe, 
smart people and you know you know great people on my team and you know good people from you know you know UK from the US office and whatever but it's a, it's it's little more than two handfuls of people right but culture is about thousands of people solving those problems on a day to day basis right and if they're pulling in the same direction and if they're aligned and if they if they drive that same passion and and they're moving together they're going to solve these problems way, way quicker than, 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 than a good strategy will, you know, because you're going to have people that are empowered who are going in the right direction. Now, it sounds so obvious when you discuss it, but I, I wonder in the majority of businesses what the, what the time spent between culture and strategy is. Or when I say strategy, even like strategy execution, right? Um, and I, I, I mean, I would say I would be surprised if it was more than 80-20, you know, but the reality, you know, 80 on the cultural, 80 on the strategy. And so the, that kind of was a, was a big wake up call. And then it was right. Well, how do you, how do you go after um, culture? Because it sounds like this soft thing, right? Like a strategy, you can really put it down and it's very simple, but like, how do you build, how do you build culture? Like, is that, you know, it, it sounds like this, this very soft thing, but the reality is like, if you want to do anything in business, you, you have to have a framework. And if you have a framework and you, you know what you're going after and you know what you want to, you know, what, uh, you know, points you want to embed within a team or, or, or what you want to focus on from a cultural point of view within a framework. Uh, I have an answer to that, uh, if you will be agree with me or not, but uh, people are making the culture. So it's not fictional, you know, but strategy, if it's especially on the paper, it's uh, fictional uh, mm. in the most scenarios. So this is the uh, difficulty. This is the challenge to um, integrate a strategy to culture. So because yeah. culture is coming from down levels, yeah. but uh, strategy, sometimes uh, a group of uh, old people are mm. uh, sitting around the table and uh, they are they are just saying, okay, this is our strategy. So yeah, yeah. not too old, I hope. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm still talking about nineties, not about you. <laughs> it's a good point, right? And I think um, so. So uh, there's three, and again, really based on the you know that that book, the Culture Code, which I highly recommend reading. Um, there was three things that a good that a team has, all the teams have from a cultural point of view, right? That there was this, you know, so that the author went into a lot of research and they looked at um, highly performing sports teams, business teams, even even jewelry, you know, this this gang of jewelry thieves that were operating in Europe. And they were just they looked at all of these organizations that were just significantly more successful over long term period than their peer group. Right. Yeah. And then they went in and they started digging around and they said, well, well, why? And I'm not talking about just having, you know, one season better, like, you know, for 10 years they were in the Super Bowl six times or, you know, that type of stuff. Right. And there was three. There was three elements that they kept seeing come up in it, right? And the first one was that the the members of that team or that that organization felt connected with the organization, right? They felt connected and they felt safe. And 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 not only connected now, but also when they thought forward, they wanted to, you know, like they they could see themselves being connected with this organization in, in twelve months or thirty six months or whatever it was, right? So that like, how do you drive that sense of connection? And that's very personalized, right? That's how you know you get an individual, uh, you know, to connect with something that that's obviously you know broader. So the first one was how do you, you know connection. The second one was around um, the teams that were highly successful had the ability to have vulnerable conversations. Now the question is, you know, vulnerable. Why do you need to be vulnerable, etc.? I guess the opposite of vulnerable would be like aggression or would be ego, right? So if you can have vulnerable conversations, you can have you can have conversations like. Where, where you can admit not to know the answer to something or to admit that you're having a challenge working through something and that th there's no ego there. The teams can come together and say, look, this is working. This is not working. I need help on this. And that ability, you know, because sometimes, again, our, our initial action or, or thought might be to, you know, I know how to do this. I got it covered and, and to be kind of, you know, ego orientated. But it's a real value destroyer. So being able to have that. That, that that vulnerable conversations to sit down and say, hey, I, you know, I need help on this. I don't know what's happening or, or, or whatever. And then the third one was around um, that the, the members of that organization were clearly aligned on where that organization was going and what steps it would take to get there. 
So if you kind of put those three together, you're feeling connected, the ability to have vulnerable conversations and, and really, really aligned on, on where it's going and how to get there, then, then you can typically, that team starts to perform quite well and the, and the culture within that team becomes very strong and, and, and self-replicating, et cetera. So that's really what, what we've looked at is how do we drive those three pillars? So again, it's, you know, it's not just this kind of airy fairy idea, but there's three very clear deliverables that we can measure, you know, how we can, we can go after, we can do actions against, you know. Yeah, the organizations uh, which apply this, uh, these three pillars mm. are uh, usually the agile organizations, you know, when we, uh, we, uh, we are seeing that uh, more and more uh, companies has uh, agile organizations that, uh, because uh, they are not uh, like uh, they, they, they are living organisms uh, in mm. the hierarchy, uh, less hierarchy. And uh, at the end of the day, a, a simple software engineer, maybe a junior engineer, is uh, starting to understand the strategy. So every work uh, that he or she does, mm. uh, he, he or she can link uh, to the cult, uh, company strategy very easily yeah 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 exactly it's such a great point and then th that that being able to do that links to the first and the third point right it links to the third point being they understand the strategy and they know the role they play in it and the steps to get there and then the second one is when you when you're doing that and you you feel that you're playing a valuable part you you you, you inherently start to feel more connected with that organization right um so you're right but the kind of the old typical uh hierarchy and 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 you know, um you know top down etc especially with the workforce that's coming into into play now right they they i mean they just have no interest in a, in a very hierarchical traditional you know structure or organization right they want to they, the impact that they want to play the way they want to be seen and treated in the, in the business is, is very different to that right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, talking about uh, workforce uh, when you become when you became a Uh, top level manager uh, did you have to deal with the structure did you have to change something uh, for, for example hierarchy the groups uh, the people the team uh, how about it yeah so I, i mean i inherited um a number of departments or divisions that weren't necessarily organized together beforehand mm -hmm. but but luckily on the whole we're, we're really full of, of of great strong leaders right yeah so So I did a bit of uh, a, a bit of reorganization, um, but it wasn't it wasn't a you know a clearing house exercise, etc. It was more around streamlining it a bit, bringing the number of uh, bringing the number of direct reports down to a manageable type, uh, manageable number, getting six heads of departments that would then have their you know be able to run their teams effectively, um, and there was probably more moving people around than there was around massive restructure, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there were, there were quite a few examples where there were there were good people who were in the wrong role, and and then, then having you know six departments or six divisions that 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 I could work with the different leaders on, we could we could really find out okay this you know this individual has so many strengths you know big uh, big cultural player has these strengths this current role is just not suiting them right, mm -hmm. and then to go and find you know what's that win win role um, and there was I, I don't know how many there were two or three times that we at least that we've done that that you know that win win scenario right. And it's the, the question before making these moves, the question I always ask the person is, is how happy are they? Like what's their level of happiness? Because invariably, if if somebody's in a role and it's not working, it's usually not just the business that has the organ has the, the the view that it's not working. Usually that individual has a sense of it as well. And that that can often lead to a lot of um That can lead to a lot of, uh, you know, unhappiness as well, right? And then, you know, I always you know, start that conversation again. What, where are you at? What's your level of happiness? Yeah. And when somebody says my level of happiness is a four and a half or whatever, well, life's too short to feel that way, right? So let's let's figure this out, right? Because clearly, this gives us a mandate that we should go and make some changes because it's not working this way. So let's go and now explore it and, and find some other ways. Um, but I mean, that's probably some of the the things that probably the the, the I don't know if, if proudest is the right word but that I've you know I, I truly value is being able to do that and and, and really get those win-win scenarios get the right people into the right positions and and then you just step back and you just watch that you know you watch the the magic flow right exactly so uh, there's another interesting uh, question uh, that I'm uh, wondering <laughs> the answer uh, 
for example, you uh, you mentioned uh, about seven or eight uh, managers are reporting to you, right? And they are managing big uh, scales as well. You know, um, so many people. They are motivating someone, and you are uh, you have to motivate them. Uh, who are uh, who ha- has to uh, motivate uh, their individuals as well? Mm, mm. So is it difficult uh, to motivate uh, managers? And they are not mid-level managers; they are big, big managers as well. Yeah. Um, if it's if it's truly difficult to motivate them, then something has gone terribly wrong, right? And it's either the, the wrong person or or, or, <laughs> or or the leadership style is is just destroying value, and people are, are greatly unhappy. You know. But the the key is how do you, you know, how how do you get that to go down? Because so for my six direct reports, we meet regularly, and we understand, you know, um, we understand each other and what we're doing and what we value and our principles. But how does that go down further? And and I can I can go and spend time with with my you know direct reports and these very capable leaders. I can go and spend time with their teams, and I do from time to time and, and check in and. But I never want to undermine them, right? It's their responsibility to run their team. So as much as I'll interact with them, I'll do that in a, a quite a, res- I, I hope, a respectful way and, and allow them to to effectively be the leaders there. So what we did quite early on is we defined the principles that as a, you know, these six departments or divisions that came together, we defined the principles that, that we wanted to, um, that, that, we, that, we, that we valued, right? Um, and it was around... You know, uh, there was a couple of them around, uh, you know, we, we, we do whatever it takes to get it done. And, you know, we do it together. There's no individual behavior, right? We, um, we highly value moving quickly. And with that, we're, you know, we tolerate failure. We understand it. We embrace it when we have to. We came up with four or five kind of principles that we wanted to have as a team, right? And then, you know, we, we, we went back and forth. There's a lot of consultancy to this. It wasn't definitely, it definitely wasn't, you know, me on a, a whiteboard writing all these things down in a, in a management meeting because that did, never gets any, any traction. Mm-hmm. But once we defined these four or five principles that, that we thought we, we valued as a team, we would then start every meeting that we had and we would, we would go and we would review them and we would go through the four or five or the five and we would say, um, how are we progressing on these? Which ones are we doing well and which ones do we need to focus on? And then those team members, those team leaders, these uh, the six kind of heads of departments, they started doing it with their own teams as well. These are, you know, these are our, our, the points we value, and they would start each meeting by re- reviewing them. Yeah. And then I guess the 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 the, the second part, and the, the, I guess just quickly to to finish off, would be we really valued the currency of performance and moving quickly, landing things, getting stuff done. You know, that that to us was was hugely important. Um, and that you know that rate of change or that rate of action that was required was was quite jarring for some at first, and it wasn't necessarily something they were used to, and there may there may have been a bit of discomfort. But people want to, I think, people want to want to be a part of a team that's that's successful, and they it's it's painful to get there, and it, you know life becomes quite maybe um, challenging for three months. But once you start to build that momentum and you start to get some wins, etc., people really value this, and they forget the pain that went along, and and then they start to embrace the change. And then that drives its own form of motivation, you know, I find. Yeah, exactly. Especially uh, in the organizations such as yours, you know, uh, so many things to do, big operations, big customer operations. So uh, problems never end, you know. So (laughs) yeah, yeah, you have to embrace it at some point. So uh, there is a question from one of our viewers. Uh, I think we partially uh, answer, uh, answered that, mm. but how about coaching mode when you reach management level? So mm. uh, I believe uh, he he or she, uh, I, I don't know, there's an avatar here, uh, is uh, asking that, uh, did you prepare for uh, how to be a good coach or uh, are you using coaching method to your, uh, in, to your team? Mm. Yeah, and it's, uh, yeah, I, it's, I mean, it's, I guess it, it's quite personal in terms of what, what coaching means and how to do it. The, yeah, yeah. I think for me, there was a, a few things. One was to be defined about it because it's so easy when you start a meeting with somebody, how are you doing? And then you just jump into it straight away, right? So tell me about this, how's this project going? What help do you need, et cetera? 
and then you know you, you're into the you're into the back and forth of, of of business before you know it right so the first i guess the first step is just to be defined about it and to say um to either schedule some meetings where it's purely only coaching or to say i'm going to spend at least the first 15 or 20 minutes on coaching and not get into it right and and coaching is very different because then it's then it's purely asking questions you know you, you you know that you're you're not coaching when you're being more directive and and giving giving direction right um when the when when you're asking questions is a good sign that you're probably being being coaching right because coaching is around guiding somebody to get enough to get to a position as opposed to telling them how to get there yeah, um, yeah. so so one was being defined and setting time apart for it and then the second was to really just rely on uh, and to really go and and, and have a question-based approach to it you know mm -hmm. um and then the third, obviously, you know, honesty is really needed in coaching um, and the ability to to have those honest conversations. And some of that comes with, with the relationship getting stronger, right? So really investing in that relationship and, you know, getting to know and understand people and um, and, and really who they are as people and, and, and to, to know that they can trust you as well, right? Yeah. So I think yeah. Those are, and then, I mean, there's various different models of it and, and, and some work well and some work for others. I, I like it probably a more a more natural one of question asking of, of relationship based and, and 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 finding a way. I think one of the thing that the challenge that's happened is the COVID crisis has definitely got in the way of coaching because everything was a crisis and everything we needed to move quickly on and we had to make all these decisions. Um, and I was reflecting upon this the other day that we almost needed to start drawing a line in the sand and saying, okay, let's how do we go out? How do we change our mindset from, you know, we, we've become conditioned over the last six months to become highly transactional to move quickly and you know how do we draw a line in the sand and go back to you know that 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 balance of coaching again yeah. because yeah. I, I i can definitely see it for myself and i'd be pretty sure like talking to other people in, in various sectors the way that we interact has changed and there's value in it because we move quickly and we make good decisions etc but we need to also slow that down and go back to okay that that one-to-one -one coaching etc yeah. yeah yeah especially uh, with covid situation uh, you are trying to do this uh, while you're at home, you, you know? So yeah. there's a physical disadvantage as well. Completely, completely. Yeah. Okay, so we were, uh, maybe you'll remember, we were talking about imposter syndrome. Uh, mm. What is imposter syndrome and uh, what's got to do with uh, being a C-level manager? Well, it could, yeah, exactly. I think it's got to do with being a human being, right? Like, <laughs> I... I certainly, when, when I when I got given this role, and it was a, you know it was such an exciting opportunity because um, I got to come back to Europe. I got to work in an exciting market in Europe. Um, I got to lead these great teams. Um, there was so much to do, and it was exciting. And 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 what was meant to be, I guess, a really happy moment around you know this opportunity that came up. I actually found myself feeling quite uh, unhappy quite quickly, and I realized because I was you know. I really doubted the ability that I had to go and 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 do this role, right? And and you know, there's that 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 gnawing feeling in the back of your mind. They're going to find out soon that they've made a mistake. They're going to find out that I I don't have the capability to do this, you know. And the more people that I spoke to, the more I realized that this was almost universally felt, right? Yeah. People felt this. Um, but it's not an easy thing to it's not an easy thing to express because. You know, our natural our natural uh, defensiveness is to is to say you know put up this kind of this this facade, right? And as soon as you put up a facade and you're not being yourself, then then it's a challenge, right? Yeah. So definitely that that imposter syndrome of you know they they've given me this opportunity, but I I'm not up for it. So you know I'm an imposter and I'm going to be found out. You know, um, so that that I think was was really quite a learning and, and quite a, an experience to go through. And, and, and like I said, I mean, I've, I've, I've coached quite a few people who have, uh, you know, in the last year and a half or so and spoken to, to, to some peers who've also come into you know, similar roles around the world. And that feeling has almost universally been there, right? Um, and it's a complete value destroyer because it stops you from, it stops, it, it can almost paralyze you and it stops you from, um, from, from sometimes having the, the courage to act. So, like it's something that I think you got to you really got to get a, a handle on quickly and 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 yeah I mean if you're being promoted within a company then you should really take comfort from that that they know you right if you work somewhere for 12 years or whatever and you get a promotion then you know okay you know they probably know you better than you think they then maybe even you know yourself right like 
they, this is not this is not just something that um, you've done three interviews and then God. And even when you're coming externally, um, you know, you've got to kind of get your head around it. You've got to, like you're saying that point, right? You've got to promote yourself first in your, in your mind that, you know, you've got this role. And the best antidote to it, I think I found as well, was, was, was get, into, get into the detail, right? Start to learn the business, start to learn the people, start to understand where the gaps are, start to separate the, you know, what is symptomatic and what is the root cause of, you know, this new business that you're going into. The more you start thinking about this, the more than you you kind of all the muscles that you have in terms of leadership management and otherwise um, you know start to come into play and and the and that imposter syndrome starts to to probably go away a bit you know so but I guess that ties to you know that that book the first ninety days that we were talking about I'm not sure if you have you have you do you know it uh, sorry it's called the, the first ninety days ah uh, yeah there's a book or there's a webinar like this uh, uh, uh. yeah. Uh, I was a, not a top level manager, but uh, I was working for a BMW project in Turkey, mm -hmm. and I, I was kind of unit manager. And uh, this book uh, they they uh, gave me as a gift, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know, I know. Yeah. Yeah. This I, I highly highly value this book, and it's such a simple concept. I mean, you can read the book, and it's got all the um, and I I recommend reading it, and it has all like you know the tools and the tactics to do it. But the the, the idea is very simple, right? What you do in your first ninety days will almost certainly define everything else that's going to happen and follow in that role. Logically, like one day, why day? Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. And if, if you build momentum and if you get some early wins and you build the trust of your team and you, you know, you're going to, you're going to then set the tone that that's how people see you. That's how people think about you. That's how people think about the team. And you're going to be known for a team that can, that, that, that gets things done and moves quickly and impactfully and is, is focused and goes after the right things and, you know, once you have that and you make a start like that, you're flying, right? And then you get this momentum and it keeps building. If you have a slow 90 days, a slow three months, and you battle to get a project together, a plan together, and, you know, you don't land some wins, uh, the team is not settled, and you don't bring them together, etc. It is extremely difficult after that to turn it around because now you've started to build this perception. You've started to build this reality. Um, and, you know, that, that if you nail it in the first 90 days, you know, almost three years, 10 years down the line, you will see, you know, what I did in the first 90 days was I can draw a line to this in terms of the direction, the, yeah. the intensity, the pace, the execution standard, whatever it might be, you know. Uh, it was a great <laughs> thing for it. Yeah. Uh, um, I was prepared, uh, I prepared the final question for you, but I think this will be your, uh, this would be your first suggestion to read this book. My uh, question was, uh, give us some, Hot tips to become a, a top level manager. Uh, cookie time. It's cookie time. Yeah. So the yeah. first answer was uh, to read this book. So yeah. is there any other suggestion? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, you know, when you say top level management, I, and, and uh, you know, that's, that's kind of you to, to position it like that. I mean, the first tip that I would say is that's probably the view of it is probably different, right? It's around. And it goes back to you know making other people look good, which is more than that. It's about how do you serve people? How do you how do you genuinely how do you genuinely help and serve others, right? And I think if that's truly a principle, then it's probably less about the seniority and the, the maybe the the other stuff that comes with it, but but more around how do you play that role in in a broader sense with with, with senior leaders, right? So I think that's that's really the first one, and and we kind of touched on that a, a little bit. Um, the second one, some of the best advice that that I was given was around once you join a leadership team, a C level, whatever it might be. Once you're in a leadership team, your priorities need to change, right? So, so if you're kind of just leading a function, then your priority is probably to that function. Once you join a leadership team, your number one priority is no longer to your function, your number, your functions. Your number one priority is to the rest of the leadership team. It's yeah. to those who you're serving on that leadership team with, because by extension, that means the business, right? Your job now is not to is is of course to lead these functions and to support and coach and and and, uh, and lead them, but your your number one allegiance and priority must be to the the rest of the leadership team that are around you, and this really changes everything because, you know, then you're you're, you're taking a more holistic business view on it. You're 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 understanding that there are other business priorities and there's give and take in that and 
it really, you know, those leadership teams that are tied and who, whose responsibility are primarily to them, to each other just seem to have much stronger, uh, you know, uh, results than, than ones uh, that don't. Right? And then your second responsibility is then to your leadership, t is to your, your, your teams that you obviously, uh, you know, lead. And then your 600th responsibility is to your career, right? Now, when you get that the wrong way around and, you know, you get into a senior position and your number one concern is your career, you know, your second concern is how your team is your team primarily and then the broader business afterwards. It's a complete recipe for disaster, right? Um, so that really stuck with me. And I, I heard that probably three years before I, I got into this role and it, it really stuck with me and I was thinking about it and, and it helped me navigate a lot. And, you know, again, this is an ideal and sometimes we we will, you know, I fall back into, you know, maybe being too, too uh, primarily looking after my, my functional teams but then I have to pull back and say, actually, my real team is the leadership team, you know, and then the rest come after that, you know. So that's that's I think would be would probably be a you know a, quite a, a big one and a learning that that I had, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was my question, but uh, we have still questions from our viewers. One of them is uh, from Typhoon. Hello, as everybody knows, that upper managements have limited times and need mm -hmm. energy more than other members to organize the duties. Actually, I wonder that, how do you motivate yourself and what's your inner energy source? Mm, good question. So the, uh, this, I think I'll answer that in two parts. The first one around, you know, needing time. As a, as a leader and at any level, but specifically, I think as you go up, if you're leading, if you're leading cross-functional teams, if you ever find that your time is genuinely really completely destroyed, it probably means you're doing somebody on you're doing somebody's job for them. So, so if I, you know, if my six reports, and luckily I've got, you know, um, I'm I'm very lucky to to lead strong strong leaders. But if I found that I had like uh, I had no time, um, you know, and, and and you know my my diary was completely destroyed, and I had no time, and I was being sucked into things, etc. Then I've learned to realize that this means that probably one of the people you know on my team uh, is not fulfilling the responsibility that they need to, and then I need to take a step back and understand why that is, and then and then go to it, you know. Um, so that's I think in terms of the time wise, because it should never be that your life is just completely destroyed in terms of in terms of time management. I mean, yes, of course it's busy, and of course we have to put in some long hours, but. But it's got to be manageable, and if it's not manageable, it usually means something. And one of your direct reports is, is there might be a, an issue there. In terms of, uh, in terms of kind of that, uh, you know, inner energy source. Um, I mean, I, I, I like to work in businesses that that require a bit of, or, or markets or regions that require a turnaround that may have lost their way a little bit, and I get an immense amount of satisfaction from from. You know, working with a highly capable team and turning a business around, right, and seeing that, seeing those that that, that improvement and that turnaround and how the results change, like that, that gives me a tremendous amount of energy. Um, so I think that's that's really, you know, that that real sense of purpose. Because when you're working in a turnaround market or or or, or, or markets, um, there's a real sense of purpose around what you're trying to do, right? So I like to to create that sense of purpose with the team, and then and then really just go after it and, and see those results come through, and and that to, that to me gives me a, a tremendous amount of energy. It makes me feel, uh, you know, because, yeah, makes yeah. me want to. Run. And that was a great question. Thank you, Typo, very much. Because I think everything starts with your uh, inner energy, you know. Uh, it, it makes you uh, get up every morning. So thank you for this question and thank you for your answer, David. Sure. And uh, th this is not a question, but we have a uh, comment like this: "World best culture, world best strategy." Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and uh, it's a good debate. I mean, you you need you need both, right? You definitely need both. My my. I think going back to what we were saying, the, the question is always to challenge ourselves: what 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 time are we putting into strategy, and what time are we putting into culture? Right? Because we never want to go 100 percent on one. But I would almost, like I say, I think that there is, you know, strong businesses probably have less challenge around this. But you know, there, there's probably a, a corporate a corporate leaning more towards strategy, which can be quite concern, can be quite counterproductive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm just putting this on the screen for laugh. Please read, David. Why I'm here? Which suggests about talk? I don't understand. 
And there's a viewer here, uh, who she or he doesn't know why he or she is here. <laughs> That's a very difficult question to ask, to answer. Uh, uh, we don't have any answer for that. So. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's fate, right? Oh, this is the, this is, this reminds me, right? Talking of fate, you know, maybe yeah. fate has brought them here. You know, you were saying, like, what are, what are some good tips and, and how do you, how do you advance a career, right? And mm -hmm. I, I would be very clear in saying that luck plays a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of a role in this, right? Yeah. Um, because we like to usually when things go badly, it's not our fault. And when things go well, it is completely only us that's done it, right? It's sometimes mm -hmm. the, the mindset. But this is not the truth of it. And, exactly. and, and luck and opportunity is a huge one, right? Mm -hmm. And being able, to, being able to identify opportunity and to use, use the luck that comes your way is so important, right? Like, I, you know, there's some of the, you know, the improvements we've had in business, et cetera. This has come along because there's been a new technology that we've managed to um, – to to identify and to roll out and it's had a huge opportunity and it's changed our business right or changed the operating part of our business and there's a certain amount of luck that that you know this technology is now available that i became exposed to it that i knew it was there etc and, and i i would always you know acknowledge that that kind of luck or that fortuitousness that can happen mm -hmm. but the key is being able to identify it and then more importantly use it right because in all our lives i think there's going to be whatever it is a million pieces of good luck that's going to come our way because that's life and it's you know it, it's random and it's coming. Yes, it's how many times are you going to identify and use that opportunity? You know, yeah. Yeah. David, I can't. Yeah. It's been already yeah. seven minutes. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't notice that. Uh, and oh, okay, uh, let's. Uh, do you have anything to uh, say additionally? Or I don't have uh, any questions, so it's about one hour now. Uh, I, I'm sure I'm I exhausted you a little bit. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. No, not at all. I mean, it's great to great to chat with you. I mean, you know, this is this is this is, I guess, some of the the, the learnings or my take from my journey. But I think there's there's no necessary right way. There's just there's different ways, and um, and this is, I guess, some of the, the 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 lessons or learnings that I've had. But it's been great to to share them with you. And I, I mean, it's a, it, I, I'm not sure of, of of the value that the, your viewers will 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 take from it. But if there is anything there, then I I hope that it was useful. If there was Thank any you. points Thank along you. the way. Oh, uh, I will just tell uh, our viewers uh, one thing. Uh, David was a great guest uh, at the very uh, from the very beginning. You know. I I met David uh, accidentally like two weeks ago, and it was a great accident, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just offered him once, and he, he uh, I and I uh, th that's the rest of it. I didn't have to chase him. He was very on point, on time. He he gave me so many good topics. And watch and learn, guests. Watch and learn. <laughs> this, this is, is a, <laughs> this is called using your opportunities. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate that uh, you, you have been here uh, with us today. And thank you very much. Please don't go anywhere. I'm ending the broadcast and uh, we will be together for a couple of minutes more. Okay. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you for that very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's for all. Thank you very much for viewing. And also, uh, it will be recorded on YouTube and LinkedIn Live as well. If you have any questions, any comments more, we are very reachable. Thank you very much for watching. Have a lovely night.